Our next story is about a billion dollar industry, one that involves hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. It's a business that shows no sign of slowing down. Unfortunately, it's not a success story, and it's certainly nothing to be proud of. I'm talking about the illicit drug industry. Ironically, an ancient practice may prove to be a very effective solution. Mimi Gan has more on that story. This is the other side of America. Desolate streets, abandoned buildings, shanty towns under freeways. Home to the homeless and the poor. But there is something that binds this part of American society together. Many are addicted to drugs like crack cocaine and heroin. A craving so strong that many people die with their addiction. Never overcoming the hunger for the next high. But there may be an answer. A new drug called ibogaine. Ibogaine is extracted from several plant species native to the rainforest of Central West Africa. First identified by botanists in the 1860s, it's commonly used by local tribes to induce hallucinations as part of initiation rituals. The ability to cause hallucinations isn't new. Drugs like LSD are well known for it. But Ibogaine is very different according to people like former heroin addict Howard Lotsaw. 33 hours after I took the Ibogaine, I walked out of my house and stopped dead in my tracks. Because all of a sudden I realized that not only wasn't I going through narcotic withdrawal, which I should have been going through, but that my entire perception towards heroin had changed from a drug which I viewed as pleasure giving to a drug which I viewed as emulating death. Howard Lotsoff was so convinced that Ibogaine could prevent drug withdrawals like this that he formed a company to promote further research. After years, United States authorities finally agreed to test the drug for safety, and it may have a great future. Imagine that you had a medication that with a single dose could completely block the desire to use drugs for months to years. Imagine that you had a medication that with a single dose could completely block all of the signs of physiological withdrawal. That's the promise of Ibogaine. Ibogaine affects the cerebellum, the part of the brain associated with learning. Users claim to see their lives appear before them, either inside their eyelids or on the surface they focus upon. This lasts for many hours, but the most astonishing finding is that when they recover afterwards, their cravings for drugs, heroin, cocaine, and even nicotine somehow seem to disappear. Step up here, I'm going to position you. For now, the questions of safety must be answered. If ibogaine affects the cerebellum by interfering with drug-taking behaviors, it may also damage other cells in the region. If this is true, then cerebella functions like balance, and coordination should be affected. You see those arcs? I want you to shift your weight from the But so far, results are encouraging. One of a battery of tests, this sophisticated balance analysis is helping demonstrate the apparent safety of ibogaine. Each of those arcs might intersect it by shifting your weight. Very good. People who are given a test dose of the drug can balance and react just as well as those who are not. Here's the uh, printout of the involuntary movement analysis. And this Notice is true for test subjects who are drug free, as well as those who are regular heroin or cocaine users. In cities where drug taking is reaching epidemic proportions, ibogaine is sorely needed. But there are still unanswered questions and concerns and a huge ethical hurdle to overcome. Is it reasonable to treat drug addiction with another drug that also has powerful effects?
Nevertheless, a substance found in a forest and used in an ancient ritual may become the solution for a very modern tribal problem. You're watching News Source 13 at 6 with Don Alhart, Chief Meteorologist Bill Peterson, and Mike Catalana on sports. Tonight on News Source 13 special assignment, a look at what could be the answer to many of Rochester's drug problems. We've asked our troubleshooter, Al White, to return to Rochester and help us find some solutions. Tonight, Al is back with the results of his investigation. Welcome back. Good to well, be here. It's Good great to be here, Don. Right back where you were when we left off. <laughs> I remember. I used to sit in this yeah. seat. You know, it's great to be back in this. This was my hometown for over 20 years, and I've never forgotten how wonderful the people are here. But you know something, Don? It saddens me to see that Rochester, like so many other communities around the country, is wrestling with an escalating drug abuse problem. But there's hope. There's a brand new scientific breakthrough that may help eliminate bonds of crack, cocaine, heroin, alcohol, and even tobacco. Whoa! Hardly a day goes by that we don't see a newspaper headline about drugs. Police say some of our Rochester neighborhoods have become drug supermarkets for outsiders. We've had uh, people as far away as Pennsylvania and other states, uh, rural areas, suburban Monroe County areas. Those who deal in drugs live in a violent and dangerous world. This memorial on the wall at the Avenue D Recreational Center is a sober reminder of the 300 children murdered between 1990 and 1994 in Rochester. Genesee Section's youth officer Tom Shaw says there's plenty of youths willing to take their chances in order to earn $40 to $50 a day dealing in drugs. Just from my experience and from my own personal investigations in this particular southwest area, I would have to say a good 30%. Uh, 30%? Uh, 30%? Percent. Yeah. Of the kids in some way or another either dealing or using? Yep. The arrest rate for violent crimes among 11 to 16-year-olds has risen dramatically between 1984 and 1994, especially in the city. Jack Rosati of the Monroe County Youth Center says most of the kids he takes in come from families destabilized by drugs. We have those kids obviously to buy, those kids that sell. We have those kids that uh, are really victims of abuse and neglect within their own families because their parents may be drug users. For example, we talked to one parent who is now in drug treatment. We're hiding her identity to protect her child. She vividly recalls why no, her son began selling drugs. When 13, he's in the foster home. But he's went out. So, yeah, at eight, nine years old. Was that because he knew that you used? Yes. This is Rochester's sister city bridge, where flags fly, representing the eight countries where Rochester has a sister city around the world. Now, would you believe that the potential answer to our nation's drug addiction problem lies in a neighboring country to our African sister city, Bamako, Mali? Little did we know that about a four-hour plane ride south of Bamako is a tiny country in West Central Africa called Gabon. In the Gabonese rainforest grows a shrub called Tabernathi Iboga, and from its roots is extracted an amazing drug called Ibogaine. Now, Ibogaine has been proven to eliminate an addict's craving, as we mentioned before, for all kinds of drugs, everything from crack, cocaine, to heroin, to alcohol, and tobacco. And, Don, the amazing thing is that it happens without any withdrawal symptoms. And as we know, that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks for an addict yeah. to try to kick his habit. We've heard of methadone, some other uh, things that are out there, but uh, curious is why we've never heard of Ibogaine before. Well, you know, I'm curious about that myself. We did some digging into that, and surprisingly, there seems to be 
a little concerted effort to uh, keep this thing a secret. It turns out that the CIA, back some 45 years ago, okay. did testing on Ibogaine, and they kept it to themselves. Okay. Okay. We'll be hearing more about that. Yeah, we like certainly that. will. We'll show okay. you that tomorrow. Okay. Also want to uh, mention to uh, computer users out there, if you're into email, you want to go online tomorrow night at 6.15. And we'll be there to uh, answer any questions you may have. The email address on your screen, wokr13 at aol.com. On to some other news. Tonight we continue Al White's special assignment. Now he has uncovered new information about a wonder drug that could be the answer to many of our community's drug problems. Al, we talked a little bit about this last night and uh, brought us up to the point where really we're anxious to know, I think, more about what Absolutely, this is. and I'm delighted to tell you the rest of the story tonight. You know, Don, Ibogaine promises to be a major scientific breakthrough in the treatment of drug and alcohol addiction. It's been tested on addicts outside the country, and now for the first time, the Food and Drug Administration has authorized testing of Ibogaine in the U.S. Here's the fascinating story of how this came about, even though our government has kept Ibogaine a secret for over 40 years. When Channel 13 sent me along with our Rochester delegation to visit our African sister city 18 years ago, little did I realize then how close Bamako, Mali, was to the location of one of the world's most significant discoveries in fighting drug addiction. About a four-hour plane ride south of Mali is the tiny nation of Gabon in central West Africa. In the rainforest of Gabon grows a shrub called Tabernathi Iboga. For thousands of years, the Gabonese chewed the roots of the aboga plant during the rite of passage of young boys into manhood. In the early part of this century, French scientists first purified the extract from the aboga root and called it ibogaine. Over the years, scientists in Europe and the United States conducted ibogaine experiments on animals to better understand how it works. And according to these government records, in the 1950s, the CIA funded secret experiments of using Ibogaine on humans at the Federal Narcotics Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. And we discovered this letter written by Dr. Harris Isbell, director of the CIA-funded project. He said his tests were performed in unsuspecting black former morphine addicts. None of the patients knew what the drug was and were given no hints. To this day, it isn't clear why the CIA was testing Ibogaine. But the fact is, the results of Dr. Isbell's experiments have vanished into the secret archives of the CIA or the Department of Defense, never to be seen again. And perhaps Ibogaine never would have become possible for treatment of drug addiction today if it wasn't for this man, 52-year-old Howard Lotsoff of Staten Island. Lotsoff was 19 when he tried Ibogaine to get a psychedelic high. But after his Ibogaine trip, he mysteriously lost his craving for heroin. Lotsov says he believed he had found a cure for drug addiction, but he says nobody in the government would listen to him then. Lotsov has since patented his own Ibogaine treatment procedures. He began running experiments in Holland. They put heroin right in my face and asked me to use some for free. And I had no desire whatsoever to use it, and I turned it down. That was the first, the first time I'd ever turned down heroin. Well, Don, of course, the reason Lutzoff did his test in Holland is because Ibogaine was banned in the U.S. around the early 70s, along with LSD. I know a lot of people may have questions, and uh, you were telling me you're going to go online on our... Uh Computer Central in the newsroom in a moment to uh, talk to some of our viewers. Absolutely. You can go online with me on America Online, and um, let's see, in a few minutes, uh, we'll be able to discuss this with our viewers by way of computer, and all you have to do is ask for the private room on America Online and click on um, WOKR13. 13 and that'll put yeah, you through. Right. Com is on there. Now, tomorrow, I might add, uh, mention, Don, that we're going to be um, go on and mm -hmm. have some more interesting things in our series, and we're going to be talking, visiting a drug treatment center here in Rochester, and we're going to see how Ibogaine might play a very important part in that treatment center. And those famous words people are waiting to hear? We'll be watching. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. All this week with a special report, and tonight we're going to conclude Al White's special assignment on Ibogaine. Now, some say Ibogaine could be the answer to Rochester's drug problem. 
Al's back with more now to tell us what he has found out, Al. Well, Don, you know, Ibogaine is a story of one man's fight to make this anti-addiction drug available to communities like Rochester. Through Howard Lutzoff's efforts, Ibogaine has finally been approved for human testing in the U.S. But before the FDA gave that approval, Lutzoff patented his own Ibogaine treatment procedures under the name Indabuse and successfully treated dozens of addicts in Holland. You're completely clean. Uh, you feel rejuvenated and you don't have any cravings. That's a really important thing. And Adam says when he visited his heroin dealer after treatment. And these were people that I smoked heroin with every day. People who have been addicted for 25 years to heroin who had never heard of any abuse. And these people couldn't believe it. They had never seen somebody stop using the amount of heroin that I've used on a daily basis like that overnight, literally. Lutzoff says his data, supported by animal research, has now allowed the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, to start human studies in the United States. The FDA has given Dr. Sanchez Ramos at the University of Miami permission to begin those studies. Results could be three years away. The news of Luxoff's Ibogaine test spread like wildfire through the grassroots organizations like this AIDS activist group headquartered at 9 Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village. Dana Beal heads up the office. How often would someone have to get an Ibogaine treatment? Just once. That's the thing about it. It's not a maintenance drug like methadone. This is the first drug where when the drug effect wears off, they're free of the addiction. Beal is excited because it could have a significant impact on the number of HIV addicts. They still may be prone sometime in the future to get back to drugs because of all their problems and predispositions. Mm -hmm. But the physical addiction and the mental craving are gone. It is estimated that seven out of every ten prison inmates are behind bars because of crimes related to drugs. So just imagine what the social impact of Ibogaine might be if the tests on humans are successful. Ibogaine could be a lifesaver for addicts recovering at Rochester Health Association's Main Quest Treatment Center. It's a two-year program that begins with initial crisis intervention, detoxing until stabilized, and plenty of group counseling. Living life on life's terms. That's what it's about, you know what I mean? Eventually, patients graduate to a halfway house and outpatient status as they learn to cope in the straight world. 50%, 60%, 70% of the time, we can get people to succeed. Some therapists believe Ibogaine will greatly enhance the chances for success in treatment programs like MainQuest. I could see that there could be some individuals who need some sort of assistance. And in that sense, it could be a help to them. Now, unfortunately, Ibogaine is only an experimental stage and is not an approved drug by the FDA. It could take three or four more years of testing before it is declared safe. But in time, Ibogaine may be the answer to Rochester's addiction problems. People, people may be interested, uh, want to know what stands in the way, or what, what can people do to... to I would... In, uh, that's a great question. I would encourage anybody, if um, they're interested in this, to contact their congressman mm -hmm. and let them know that it's crucial that there be funding available to expedite the testing of this drug because and, it's really important. And your reports this week have uh, brought some people forward we're going to hear tonight. Yes, we have a real treat for you for the 11 o'clock news tonight. We have a gentleman who saw our report and caught up and says, hey, I huh. took Ibogaine. I, I'm an addict and I took Ibogaine and it saved my life. We're going to have his report tonight. Fascinating. Story. Okay. Thank you, Al. It's like being dead and coming back to life again. This 28-year-old Rochester man should know. He was in a living hell and wanted to die. He asked us to conceal his identity. We'll call him Tom. I started when I was 14, but I crossed the line when I was 20 years old when I first smoked cocaine. But in the end, drugs almost killed Tom. Finally, after he relocated to Florida, he says his mother saw a newspaper article about Ibogaine experiments at the University of Miami. They contacted a doctor mentioned in the paper. She wrote back, she said, she said the letter made her cry. 
And she says, you're a good candidate for this program. Was this treatment free? And it cost $15,000. <clears> to go into the high beginning treatment? Yeah, they had to do it outside of the United States because it's not approved by the FDA. It took another year and a half before Tom traveled to this clinic in Panama for his Ibogaine treatment. So what did Ibogaine treatment do for you? The cravings removed, the obsessions removed. You don't even feel like using. You feel like you're pure. You don't even want to smoke a cigarette because you just feel so cleansed. You know, you, you just feel everything's gone. How long has it been since you went through your treatment? Almost, mm, almost two years. And you're clean? Yeah. I'm Al White for News Source 13, and we'll be watching. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Bill O'Reilly, and in the Unresolved Problem segment, curing drug addiction, as we all know, it, that is extremely difficult. But most of us don't know about Ibogaine. That is a medicine derived from an African shrub that some believe can cure the physical effects of drug addiction within 72 hours without any pain. But Ibogaine is not available in America. Why? With us now is Howard Lotsoff, whose company, NDA International, holds the patent on Ibogaine. So very simply, why can't we get Ibogaine in the USA if it'll cure drug addiction, at least physically? Uh, we don't have Ibogaine available because we don't have $20 million to satisfy the FDA regulatory testing. So you have to, the FDA wants to test the shrub or whatever it is further than they already have, well, and yeah. you don't have the money to fund that. That's correct. Well, why doesn't exactly. the government fund it? I mean, it seems that it would be the greater good of America to have something that would cure physical drug addiction. Uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse has simply determined that it's more to their advantage to spend $300 million over the next 10 years evaluating cocaine vaccines and cocaine antagonists, in other words, drugs that block the action of cocaine, than spending $10 million to determine if the FDA will approve Ibogaine, a drug which is not only effective for... But why would cocaine. they do that? I mean, why do you want to spend 300 million as opposed to 10? That doesn't make any sense. If you're the director of, of a bureaucracy, 300 million dollars is a lot better than... Oh, I see. So they want more money. Now, listen, we uh, contacted the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, which Howard referred to. They don't want to come on the program, no surprise there. And they issued this statement that I really can't make... <laughs> I mean, I don't know what they're talking about here. But they say in the statement, that they're continuing to study Ibogaine. That's what they say in the statement, but uh, you don't believe they're really serious about it, do you? No. The, the, the answers that we've gotten from researchers in the field is they're being told don't bother to submit grant applications because they'll be rejected. We uh -huh. don't have interest in this substance. I have a, re a, bu a bunch of real short questions I need short answers to. They say that Ibogaine is a hallucinogenic drug, that if you take it, it's like LSD. that true? Ibogaine is not LSD-like at all. Uh, in some patients, it precipitates a dreamlike state, which lasts for approximately four hours. Is it addictive? It's not addictive. So it's not like methadone? No. It doesn't right. cause chemical dependence. It's not a maintenance drug. It's a single administration now in you, hospital. Now, you've taken this drug yourself. That's correct. I discovered Ibogaine's anti-addictive effects in 1962 when I was a young heroin addict. And I had no idea what it would do. And I took Ibogaine, and 33 hours later, I was no longer a heroin addict. So you were a heroin addict? That's correct. And where did you find this Ibogaine? Uh, I was uh, interested in psychoactive substances, and a chemist I know gave me a dose. He knew nothing about it. And you never used heroin again after that? I uh, became re-addicted about uh, three and a half years later. I went on a methadone program. But what Ibogaine taught me was that addiction was reversible. Once so, you have that knowledge. I want to get this straight now because it's an interesting story. Yeah. You were addicted to heroin, you took the Ibogaine, you kicked your addiction. Right. You didn't have any pain, you weren't thrashing around None or anything whatsoever. like that. But you weren't cured mentally, psychologically. For, for three and a half years, yes. Yeah, and you then, stayed off it, but right. it doesn't cure the mental anger. Oh, no, absolutely. It interrupts the craving and desire to use drugs. So you didn't have a, a craving for three years? None whatsoever. And then you just had it again? Yeah. And then you just succumb to it again. And then Shame on you. Um, but anyway, so you got back to the Ibogaine, and from that time on, you've been trying to bring it to the attention of the public. That's correct. And no, you're getting nowhere on this thing. Uh, there's research going on worldwide, but we're running into more opposition. Than Is we there are. anywhere that you can get I Ibogaine in the world? We offer treatment in hospitals in the Republic of Panama. Panama? Where, where the Ministry of Health, of all places, the Ministry of Health in the Republic of Panama has approved Ibogaine. Therapy. Yeah, well, if you can grease them a little bit, they'll approve 
anything. I hate to be cynical, but you know how it is. Down well, there. the Food and Drug Administration approved Ibogaine Research. Nobody will fund it. Nobody will fund it. It, it seems that it's, it's crazy if this would stop the physical cravings, and if you say psychological cravings, that they wouldn't, that this would so solve a tremendous social problem worldwide. Well, it makes you ask a lot of questions, doesn't it? And we did ask them, but the National Institute of Drug Abuse, again, would not come on or, re or um, give us any in hard information about it. We're going to continue to investigate this, Howard. We want to have you back on this. I we appreciate, appreciate your candor, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Ibogaine hydrochloride is one of 12 indole alkaloids derived from the rainforest plant Tabernanthia boga, found in West Equatorial Africa. Ibogaine is used in detoxification and the treatment of chemical dependency disorders. Ibogaine is being evaluated for the following claims. It is administered orally, is non-addicting, is a single administration modality, eliminates narcotic withdrawal symptoms, is administered in a hospital over two to four days, interrupts drug craving and drug seeking behavior, is effective for extended periods. The problem with me is I can always say to myself, well, maybe I can just do it once. Like, the thing is, I think I can control it. I want to be able to do it normally. But where i got to realize I can't do it normally. I wouldn't be an act if I could do drugs normally. If the, doing drugs is normal, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, but, I mean, I can't do it. I can't be a weekend warrior, I guess, for lack of better words. I think there's the illusion with a lot of acts that we want to be able to control our addiction. When we can't control it at all, we can't do it. It's not like I can't, I can't do it half the time, because at one time, once is too many, and never is enough, I guess, to quote it all saying. So then I always want to tell myself that I can do it just once, and of course once leads to twice, and twice leads to three times, so I think I have to accept the fact that I can't do it. At the time that Mark was about to go to Panama, the psychotherapy group had been going on for nine months. He was doing well. He had enrolled in school. He was very excited about going to school. And um, he thought that this was a golden opportunity for him to straighten out his life. Um, but by March, he was discouraged about going to school all the time. He didn't realize what kind of responsibility it was. Um, he, his anxiety started to increase. He was angry at everything that happened at home, although he wasn't able to be specific about what was going on at home. Um, Mark, by the way, lives with his mother, and at 32 years old, um, it seemed that that was a very difficult thing for him to be doing. Um, that could have been a trigger for him to start to use drugs again, the fact that he couldn't cope with his mother, or the fact that um, the students in school were much younger than he was. And as time progressed, as March continued, um, I think that the drugs increased. As of now, where I'm at now, um, I have about my 100 milligrams of methanol. Um, I did about I do about two, three to five bags a day, when I, when I can get the money, and um, I'm starting to smoke coke to get more. I kind of like not to want to like really think about what's going to happen. I'd rather let let it take me. I don't want to like say what's going to happen. I'd rather let it. It will tell me what to do. I, it's something I can't really say what's going to happen. I just hopefully will not, it will, whatever happens, it will relieve me of that want for a while, and hopefully within that time, I'll be able to have the strength within myself not to want it, you know, get the tools to not have to want it. Uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Edgardo de la Serra. I'm a specialist in addiction medicine. I'm in New York uh, assisting the 25th Annual Medical Scientific Conference of ASAM. 
which is the American Society of Addiction Medicine, representing the Panamanian chapter of this organization. I am also the researcher in charge of the experimental therapy with ibogaine, which is a new drug uh, in experimental phase used to treat addiction. In March of 1994, we participated in a clinical trial in which we administered ibogaine to patients who was in an active opioid dependence. What we find was really interesting. We conducted this experimental trial with the complete cooperation and authorization of the Panamanian government. The clinical relevance of the ibogaine use in the treatment of opioid dependent patients is too important to be minimized. And two, all the efforts have to be done to complete the clinical research that make ibogaine more available to the treatment of these patients. Right now I'm in uh, Panama City, I'm in a hospital, uh, you know, and tomorrow morning I'm going to take the Ivo game, the end of use treatment. And, uh, you know, I feel pretty, uh, pretty anxious, um, but uh, I'm glad it's going to happen. I mean, you know, I mean, because of the way things are going, the problem is when I use a lot of cocaine and it doesn't help depression, in fact, it makes it worse. So uh, things are getting, you know, wasn't bad yet, but it was going to begin to, I could see what was the pattern that was becoming to happen. And uh, I think it's definitely, this definitely came to the right time, you know, I'm glad for it. What kind of tests did they do on you today? Um, they did AKG. They did, uh, I think, for my brain and for my heart. They've been taking my, uh, my blood pressure, my temperature, pretty much all day, every, every hour. One. And also they did a... A test dose of and abuse, and just to see how it would affect me. And I tried that, and it just basically put me this relaxed me very nicely. And uh, it's preliminary to see just how I will do as far as my blood pressure, and you know, just to be a little worried about my brain, and my my brain waves, and my heart rate when I first took the uh, pre-test uh, about two weeks ago. So I wanted to check it again. I guess everything's okay. So um, basically, just just leading up to tomorrow, and um, everything seems fine, and I feel pretty okay. And I'm glad, like I said, I'm glad this is coming at the right time. It just wasn't so rushed, but you know, I can't do everything. <laughs> Thank you. So it's at 8.55 a.m. Just being redundant? Just being redundant? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
have other thoughts besides those of um, about your addiction? I mean, do you have other thoughts and, and memories? Uh, yeah, it's kind of that. It's, it's a very important part of my life for you. How old are you? Very, very. You look very emotional. Do you feel a lot of emotions? Do you feel sad or do you feel happy? Just uh, confused. Confused. Uh, just, you know, it's just like it's all a whole wine movie of my life, and it's just like telling me all these things. Did you want to say something more? Oh, I said, everything's fine. Okay. I don't see a lot of things to see like that. Um, you know how I do 
with my mother. You know, it's something you know, I how, how, how I can uh, make better man better, better people to really love my mother. That's really my life. Uh, it's like, it's just, everything is like, it's going around, and, 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 and I don't really need to do drugs to do this. You know, it's giving me a very good feeling. It's intense, but it's a good feeling. What do you mean it's going around? What? What do you mean everything's going around? No, it's, well, it's going around, like, you know, spinning around, moving, going, 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 going across spaces. Everywhere, everything just like it's comes at you constantly. You know, all these hallucinations. I saw a bird before with a, a, a glass cup in her hand, she changed into a little fall and floated down field papers and, and did something like that. Any memories? Man. Feels good though. Mm -hmm. Three and a half hours. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? I'm very hot. Very hot. Very hot. Hot or high? Hot. It's like so amazing all this information. I mean, there's amazing information. I mean, it's like figuring things out real fast. Oh, it's very really great. Faster than the other times. Yeah. Can you share some of the information you're getting? Um, uh, uh, let's see, um, and it was about like a cop. Um, um, these things like big angels floating across the room, uh, you know, things like moving on the walls, you know, like shadow walk up, we'll come off the wall and walk over to me, you know. Or maybe like, um, I don't know, like, you know, I'll take a toy train, I'll turn into a truck or something, I don't know, something like that. Any, any memories? No, no, no. Just more strange visualizations? Well, you know, it's like, strange uh, visualizations. It's very weird because they move so fast and you can't really describe it, but it's like, you know, it's 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 because what I'm seeing in my mind is what's going on with me in my life, and it, and it all interconnects, and it's just kind of, um, um, it's, uh, is it hard to focus and speak to me? Yeah. Mark? Yeah. You want to comment? You're at six hours. Uh, sure. Where are you now? Okay. Well, I'll tell you, you know, it's now about six hours after study, and I don't feel like I want to get high no more. I, I, I mean, the Iowa King did for me was it made me saw the choice I had to make. Am I going to get real or am I going to be a fucking idiot? You know? And it's way to play it simple like that. You can be a drug addict or you can be a success. I mean, it's your choice. How did it help you to make that decision? Because, um, 
Yeah, it just showed me that, like, you know, everything resolves around, but to have drugs in my life wouldn't be so as fucked up. You know, and it seems like it's, revolving, it's all revolving around a combination of my pain growing up, just your problems and, and you know, and everything else that comes come to it. And you seem to be able to speak a lot easier now. Yeah. And Before all that was the really Arab, I was like, I was like, I had time moving. I had trouble moving. Trouble moving. What about now? Now I'm okay now. I feel pretty good actually. I'm surprised. No, believe it or not, it's been seven hours. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time. I feel completely different. How do you feel different? I, feel, I just feel a, a very positive feeling. I just cannot do the drugs to cure my problems. If I do drugs to cure my problems, then it's, it makes me, it's like I'm a master of my own destiny, I guess, you know? And, and um, basically, like, you know, as long as I, if I don't do coke, dope or coke, nothing, I'll be fine. So, um, I don't want to do that ever again. I don't want to even do coke or dope again, no. No, I don't want to You're still feeling the effects? Yeah. How do they feel? Uh, it's pretty like, it's, it's not as heavy as it was a few hours ago. But, um, it's, it's been a while real quick. Yeah. Maybe I change it. I don't want you to get up, but could you get up and walk around if you wanted to? Uh, no, I can't. It's on my arm, but so if, you, if you didn't have that on your arm, I will walk. I can't walk. Are you tired? No, I'm just. Uh, Do you feel any withdrawal? No. Okay, we are at 10 hours. It's 7 o'clock. What's up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not sick now. You know, I don't feel... I feel very at peace. I really do. I mean, I can take care of the problems, I do the right thing, you know, it's definitely shown me a very strong message of which way to go, you know, when turning on visualizing all that. Um, After the treatment was conducted, I have the opportunity to keep track of the evolution of this patient. Yesterday, I have the op opportunity to interview two of them. I have noticed great change, both physical and emotional. None of them are taking any kind of drugs. This is amazing because patients on methadone are very difficult to dis disintoxify. Mark talked about how unhappy he had been prior to going down to this treatment and that he really needed to get his life under control. And the way to do that was to face all of the fears that he had in his life. And from a psychoanalytic point of view, that meant that he was willing to look at his mother, to look at his early childhood, to look at the, um, how his stepfather had um, hurt him and discouraged him from being able to be uh, confident in himself and that he was able to see that all of these earlier memories and all of these earlier um, situations with his mother that he had not given much weight had really caused him to be uh, very frightened about almost everything that he has to face in his life. So 
he was willing to work on them, and he decided that Ibogaine really showed him all of this, but that he was now going to have to struggle himself in treatment and kind of, quote, face his demons. My problem breaks down to three major points. My childhood, my inability to have relationships, and my fear. And, you know, I think fear plays a very important part in drug, re you know, drug, uh, drug acts uh, lives because we're so afraid. I mean, we do heroin to escape our pain, and we're so scared that, you know, like, you know, we, we may feel dose sick, and immediately we get, we get afraid because we, we feel that. And the more we do heroin, the more removed we get. We don't even understand why we're doing it. And for me to understand, like, I began to look at my life. I began to uh, look at my relationships, why I was certain things happened. You know, admitting that I cannot do it once. I, can only, I can't do it once. I can't mess with it. It took me three years of going through drug rehab, reality house. I was in uh, methanol programs. And I, I mean, just to be able to, to say that I cannot a, 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 and understand that is very important. Um, and then understanding, like, admitting that my relationships were bad, looking at, um, looking at why I do the things I do, breaking down my triggers. I mean, I would, uh, if I get very upset, I do drugs. You know, um, anger, I do drugs. If my emotions come up, I do drugs. Beginning to understand what fear is. I think if I could label I will, this I will pass I, end abuse experience is understanding my fear. His energy when he came back from Panama was was euphoric. He, he was very enthusiastic and very excited. Um, in general, his whole affect had changed, um, but not, nothing specifically ex externally had changed. His relationship with his mother was still the same. The difficulty in school remained. People in school were still much younger than he was, and he still had the same insecurities. But I remember that his whole general attitude when he came back from Panama was incredibly positive. None of these issues were a, a major struggle for him. They didn't discourage him like they, like they did right before he went to Panama. And all of these issues that perhaps triggered his drug use were, were no longer that intense. You know, end abuse for me has given me my life back. It enabled me to look at myself, examine myself, and heal myself. With a, and I think more people should try an abuse. I think it should be more made available because, I mean, it is such a beautiful thing to be able to release the chains that keep you in the hell called drug addiction. We know that addiction is um, a, a disease that has a bio, biological, and psychological, and a social component. And we believe we are doing, with the ibogaine, an intervention in the biochemical and I'm in the psychological levels. So I think that ibogaine is, is a perfect um, complement to rehabilitation. Um, together, I think that um, these patients have a better chance not not to use um, for for a longer amount of time. And then I would hope that as a therapist, we would be able to use that opportunity of clean time to build up these patients' coping mechanisms to build up their self-esteem and to give them different kinds of behaviors that they can use um, instead of going back to medicating themselves. I consider the use of ibogaine for the rapid interruption of addictive disease will be a judging stride in the treatment of chemical-dependent patients.